This is CBC Winnipeg News. Good evening. Thanks for joining us tonight. Jets fans will soon gather in downtown Winnipeg to celebrate the playoffs. True North unveiled its plans today for this year's whiteout street parties. CBC's Gavin Axelrod gives us a preview of what fans can expect. The forecast calls for a whiteout like these. Where thousands of Winnipeg Jets fans pack the streets for playoffs. The way our city embraces the Stanley Cup playoffs has become legendary. Thousands will gather at Donald Street between Portage Avenue adjacent to Canada Life Centre. And these fans can't wait. It's community, you're hugging people, high-fiving people you've never met before, but you just kind of all become one cohesive unit, one large friend group, one giant gathering. It's pretty fun to be around. Jets fan James Barnaby agrees. It's a totally different beast than watching it at home alone or talking with your buddies. This is getting together. It's, it's a part of the community. Tickets for the street party are $10. Half goes to charity. The province will put up $75,000 per round. And Premier Wab Kanu says the more rounds the Jets win, the more it costs the government. This is one area of government finance where I don't mind seeing us go over budget. <laughs> The city is putting in $50,000 one time. And True North says it's covering the cost of security. This costs us money, um, especially as you go deeper. There's also another party inside Hargrave Street Market and outside in True North Square called Party in the Plaza. That ticket is $20. Bobby Matola with Academy Hospitality runs the market. To galvanize the community and sort of a common energy to bring something super exciting back downtown, it helps everyone. True North says they're adding a third big screen with more music and food. 5,000 fans can fit at the street party, and the first chance to buy tickets is April 17th. Gavin Axelrod, CBC News, Winnipeg. Now to some difficult news. The chief of Lake St. Martin First Nation is facing multiple charges connected to an alleged sexual assault of a child. Christopher Travers is also charged with possessing and making child pornography. But as CBC's Rosanna Hempel reports, he maintains his innocence. The chief of Lake St. Martin First Nation is facing four charges, including sexual assault and possessing and making child pornography. Christopher Travers was arrested by Winnipeg police in February. Lake St. Martin elder Florence Wood says she's concerned how it will affect the community. I'm concerned about everybody. Our community should, should have a, a chief that helps people not, not, go, not step backwards. Police say the victim is an elementary school age child. Court records show the alleged offenses happened in Winnipeg in late December. Travers tells CBC News he's innocent. Travers held a community meeting at a Winnipeg hotel last week. It was that day, Wood says, community elders gave the chief a letter asking him to resign. Travers told CBC News he would not be stepping down. So it's up to him, but he's not going to be our chief. He can't. Things can't just come to a complete standstill. Already we, we have a feeling that they have. Wood says if elders don't get an answer within seven days, they've agreed to sign a petition to have Travers removed as chief. Vancouver lawyer Aaron Kristoff says under the First Nations Election Act, a chief or councillor can lose their seat. That is if enough people sign it. Usually that threshold is going to be higher than 50% because... You know, if this person's in office, they've been obviously been elected by a certain number of the members. So it becomes a question of if you're going to remove them from office, it's got to be a pretty strong threshold. Um, now, what that is, as I say, it kind of varies from nation to nation. Meanwhile, the Interlake Reserve's Tribal Council is calling an emergency meeting. Lake Manitoba Chief Cornell McLean says the council will look to add bylaws on member misconduct. There's nothing surrounding misconduct, and, and that uh, you know that alarms me because uh, you know uh, a chief of, of any First Nation, uh, and you know is not subjected to to any passes, right? You know we, we're all subjected to the same laws. Lake Saint Martin Council says it has no comment at this time. Traverse's next court date is set for early July. Rosanna Hempel, CBC News, Winnipeg. 
RCMP say officers in southern Manitoba have removed three children from situations where they were being sexually abused and exploited. All of them are under the age of six. The Internet Child Exploitation Unit arrested four people last month. They found tens of thousands of images of child sexual abuse. It happened in three different communities. RCMP will not name them to protect the identities of the victims. The four suspects are all men between the ages of 37 and 56. They all face charges related to making and distributing child sexual abuse imagery. A Winnipeg City Councillor is apologizing after comments he made at yesterday's public works meeting. A debate was underway about making the intersection of River and Osborne safer for pedestrians. Have a listen. Realize the bicycle lots. He wants to take away all the links in the cars, but well, you're going to have an east. You're going to have an east west. Bike Winnipeg's Mark Coho seemed to be the target of those comments by Russ Wyatt. Coho is calling for Wyatt's removal from the Public Works Committee over the remarks. The mayor called for Wyatt to apologize. At first, Wyatt said he wasn't ready to say sorry, but late this afternoon, he did send a statement to CBC saying his comments weren't directed to any one person. He says he regrets using those words and apologized. Wyatt said his comments were made out of frustration because he believed leaves Bike Winnipeg, wants to make it harder for people to drive. Unfortunately or fortunately, the car is the practical means right now in Winnipeg. And until that changes, to make it harder for people to use their vehicle, while well, at the same time saying you're doing it in the, to advance cycling, I don't agree with. Public Works Committee Chair Janice Luke says she's filing a complaint against Wyatt with the city's integrity commissioner. Lawyers for two City of Winnipeg planners were in court today to appeal a judge's decision awarding millions of dollars to a local developer. Developer Andrew Marquise won a lawsuit last year against the city. He argued the planners deliberately delayed his application to build housing on the Parker lands in Fort Gary. Justice Shauna McCarthy found the planners deliberately stalled the project at the direction of area councillor John Orlico, who was not named in the lawsuit. She awarded Marquise $5 million. Today, lawyers for planners Michael Robinson and Braden Smith said the judge made serious errors. They say McCarthy misunderstood the city's development process. They also argue there were legitimate planning reasons for not approving the project, which the judge did not properly consider. The appeal hearing is set to resume tomorrow. A 32-year-old man has been charged with second-degree murder following Tuesday's shooting near Furby Street and Cumberland Avenue. Police were patrolling the streets around 12.45 a.m. when they heard gunshots. They found Edison Erskine suffering from a gunshot wound. The 46-year-old was taken to hospital but was later pronounced dead. The suspect, Jordan Tyler Trachillis, was later arrested in the same day. Police believe the two were involved in an argument that led to the fatal shooting. Their relationship is unclear. Investigators are asking anyone with information, including video surveillance, to get in touch. Thousands of Muslims spent the morning praying together at the RBC Convention Center in Winnipeg. They were marking the end of Ramadan, but celebrations were tempered this year as the war in the Middle East rages into its sixth month and Manitobans think of their families overseas. CBC's Brittany Greenslate has more. Um. Row after row after row, thousands of Manitoba Muslims prayed shoulder to shoulder, coming together to mark the end of the holy month of Ramadan. It means a lot, like it's a festival, right? So you just come up over here and like you fasted for 30 days and now you just enjoy celebrating their families. But for Musa Shakur, this year's event at the RBC Convention Center has added emotion because of the fighting in Gaza. This year it's like quite sad for us because of like a lot of repercussions in areas of Middle East but like yeah but we are we are hoping for like better this year. It was a sentiment echoed by many. We still feel bad for them because they cannot enjoy the Eid as we are doing right now so we are happy to be here but we still feel sad for them. Aisa Sibide is from West Africa. She came with her mom and two kids. For her prayers carry extra weight this year. The fact that we all come together 
and uh, pray all together, not only for the Middle East, but for the entire world. She brought her children to make sure they understand early on why today is significant. To me, it's important that my kids, uh, that they grow up uh, with our culture, our tradition, and uh, the Muslim faith, because to me, this is the most important thing to tackle this world, so to be faithful and trust God. Manitoba's Muslim community is growing. More than 15,000 people took part in prayers at the convention centre, and the Islamic Association says it's important to ensure that everyone feels welcome, even if they're new to the province. For those who don't have family here, they feel it the most. And so it's our job, people who are here, who've been here for a long time, to bring people together and treat them like family. We are one family, and that's the purpose of holding a prayer like this. This year, under the shadow of the war in Gaza, celebrations for many have been scaled down. Many will spend the afternoon just with family and say they must be sensitive to their relatives who are struggling. The people overseas have a strength that we do not have, and they're able to face difficulties that we would never be able to face. But what we can do for them is make prayer and wish that things will get better as soon as possible. Part of Eid is giving back. They took donations for the association and to cover the cost of hosting a celebration for thousands. Brittany Greenslade, CBC News, Winnipeg. Hundreds also celebrated Eid al fitr in Brandon. A giant community feast was held after prayers to celebrate the end of the Ramadan fast. Brandon Islamic Centre President Amir Farooq says the city's current mosque can only fit about 150 people, so they need to rent a bigger space every Eid. Farooq says this year the historic dome building was so full some had to pray outside. We start our day with the prayers, like uh, we prayer time was 9 o'clock, but at 8.30, the hall was full. So the hall capacity, I don't know, I asked that before it's 400, but the, we were over capacity and we opened the door and people were standing in the cold. The Brandon Islamic Center has talked about building a bigger mosque for about a decade. Farouk says the group is now looking at a site in the east end of the city. Hundreds of surgeries are still regularly being postponed in Manitoba, even under an NDP government that says it's increased surgical capacity. For more, we're joined by CBC's Ian Fraze, live in our newsroom. Ian, hundreds of surgeries were being postponed under the former PC government as well. So what are they saying now? Yeah, the Tories are saying that the NDP shouldn't have cancelled the task force responsible for cutting the surgical backlog. The task force was an idea from the Tories but the NDP dismantled it, saying it was too focused on surgeries at private clinics at the expense of the public health care system. Today in question period, the PCs presented numbers from a Freedom of Information request showing that nearly 470 same-day surgeries were postponed in the last three months of 2023. The government was quick to say it was worse under the PCs. A hundred more same-day surgeries were postponed in the same time period of 2022. Now that did not stop PC health critic Kathleen Cook from pointing a finger at the NDP. One of the first things the government did upon taking office is cut that task force. So it's difficult to say um, how much better those numbers could have been if the task force hadn't been cut. We want to continue to move in a better direction. We, uh, over that quarter, have actually improved capacity and the numbers of surgeries being postponed and cancelled have been decreasing. But we know we have to do more. Meanwhile, security at Manitoba's largest hospital is being beefed up. Healthcare workers have been asking for this for a few years now. What exactly is this help? Institutional safety officers will begin patrolling HSC on Monday. Now, these are specialized security officers trained in de escalation techniques with the power to make arrests. They'll also have pepper gel, a thicker, more targeted alternative to pepper spray. Health Minister Zoma Asaguera says it's valuable, but it's just a start. We are also looking at implementing metal detectors. We're looking at enhancing and improving the use of amnesty lockers. Uh, we're looking at uh, police presence. We're also looking at community safety host program being on site there and elsewhere. Institutional safety officers will also soon be posted at St. Boniface Hospital, the Victoria, 
Brandon Regional and the Selkirk Mental Health Center. The government wouldn't give us a timeline today on when they'll be ready. Emily. Thanks, Ian. CBC's Ian Frays in our newsroom. Well, it was another warm day here in Winnipeg. CBC weather specialist Ethan Williams joins us now with the forecast. Well, thanks, Emily, and uh, a little bit of some unstable uh, weather conditions today, and that is uh, leading to a few lightning strikes with some pop-up showers and thunderstorms a little bit earlier this afternoon in southwestern Manitoba, just kind of south of Brandon and through uh, southeastern Saskatchewan as well. Those are now starting to move down uh, stateside. In the Winnipeg area, we've seen a few showers just popping up east of the city a little bit earlier this afternoon. Those continue to move off to the east uh, as well. And with that little bit of instability, we've also been seeing winds pick up a little bit here and there, specifically in the southwest corner of the province. Some gusts over 40 up toward uh, 50 kilometers an hour kind of here and there. Temperature wise though, uh, very similar to what we've seen these past couple of days, getting into those teens, uh, not only in southern Manitoba, but uh, double digits well into the north as well. You can see along the Hudson Bay coast there and in Churchill, uh, temperatures much cooler today, only down into the single digits. A uh, couple of areas of low pressure fueling this uh, unstable air mass today. And those showers likely going to continue popping up as we head through uh, the rest of the evening and potentially into the overnight hours as well. Winnipeg, we could see another band of some rain early tomorrow morning. By tomorrow afternoon, though, mostly clear skies uh, through southern Manitoba. Cloud cover and some uh, flurries, though, and some light snow continuing to linger in the north. Maybe a few pop-up showers for the drive home tomorrow afternoon in the Red River Valley. And then a more substantial clearing as we head into the weekend. Northern Manitoba will look out for some showers and some snow over the weekend from that system moving in from Saskatchewan. Uh, those pop-up showers uh, probably bringing between about 2 and 4 millimeters of rain. But again, it really depends on who is actually going to be getting that rainfall and if we're actually going to be seeing those uh, showers kind of come to fruition. Almost certain though that the north is going to see some substantial snowfall, uh, especially in the far north, uh, Gillam area upwards of five centimeters, a good two to four centimeters uh, for many locations there. Winds also going to continue to be a factor overnight tonight, some gusts over 40, including in the Winnipeg area. That likely uh, continuing into tomorrow afternoon. Breezy at times, particularly in southeastern portions of the province. We should start to see those die down a little bit, though, as we head into Friday. So for your day tomorrow in Winnipeg, uh, looking at an 8 a.m. temperature of 3 degrees. Not bad wind-wise. We'll be looking at a mix of sun and cloud. That is a theme pretty much throughout the day tomorrow. The noon hour, those winds picking up a little bit here and there, uh, close to 40 kilometers an hour. A chance of showers mid tomorrow afternoon and just before the drive home, as I say, but a temperature still quite nice sitting around 14 degrees. I'll have a look at your full provincial forecast, Emily, coming up. Thanks, Ethan. A springtime warning today from Winnipeg police. As the ice melts on rivers and lakes, police say people should be extremely careful around open waterways. They say drowning can happen any time of the year. The police service says a third of all drownings in Manitoba happen during the colder months between October and April. Still ahead, the Bank of Canada has decided to hold its trend-setting interest rate at 5% for a sixth consecutive setting. More on what that means after the break. You're watching CBC Winnipeg News.
The Bank of Canada held its key interest rate steady at 5 percent for a sixth consecutive setting, but it's also signaling that rate cuts are getting closer. So the question remains when and by how much. CBC's Nisha Patel has more. Growing more slowly than the working. The Bank of Canada says inflation is coming under control, but officials are keeping interest rates steady for now. We are seeing what we need to see, but we need to see it for longer to be confident that the progress towards price stability will be sustained. If you look at Just how much longer was unclear, though the governor did open the door to a rate cut in June. Yes, it's within the realm of possibilities. After a series of rapid hikes, rates have been at 5 percent since July of last year, forcing many consumers to curb their spending. The economy is in a soft spot. We've seen that business bankruptcies are piling up. That's beginning to infect the labour market data. Economists say the central bank is in a tricky spot. What they're trying to do is get rates down without stoking inflation, but also avoid pushing the economy into a contraction. Canadian mortgage holders are desperate for relief. Millions are facing renewals this year at dramatically higher rates. It's shocking. It's like a 40% increase in payment, if not more. So, yeah, there's a lot of payment shock that goes on, and that's worrisome for everybody. This mortgage broker warns while interest rates rose quickly, they may not come down at the same pace. Even if the Bank of Canada cuts, and they will, we don't know how fast they will cut, and we don't know how deeply they will cut. While the central bank says a June cut is possible, many market watchers say interest rate relief is more likely to come in July. Nisha Patel, CBC News, Toronto. The federal government is bracing for a repeat of last year's devastating and record-breaking wildfire season. Several cabinet ministers have unveiled Ottawa's plans to prepare for the worst. CBC's Lindsay Duncombe has the details. It is getting warm outside across much of the country. Whatever snow fell has melted or is melting, and federal ministers sound nervous. We can expect that the wildfire season will start sooner and end later and potentially be more explosive. This is what officials are worried about, a repeat of last year. Eight firefighters died, 15 million hectares burned. That's seven times the annual average. Smoke blanketed the continent. The entire city of Yellowknife forced to flee. This is what conditions look like now, dry across much of the country. Extreme drought conditions in parts of Alberta, the Northwest Territories and BC. Just how dry? Check out this riverbed in Prince George, British Columbia. Adding to the risk, predictions of above normal temperatures in the weeks and months to come. This is really an all hands on deck moment. This is not, uh, this is not something that any level of government can address on its own. First Nations are especially vulnerable. Training programs and additional staff are helping many communities prepare. If we have persistent dry weather and no precipitation, yeah, then I'll, I'll, I'll get nervous. Um, and for me, the biggest thing is to have my crews ready to go. And ahead of next week's budget, the federal government announced it is doubling the tax credit for volunteer firefighters to $6,000, potentially more cash for those on the front lines. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Vancouver. After days of testimony from security agencies and senior government officials, the public inquiry into foreign interference in Canadian elections heard from Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. He and members of his cabinet testified about what they knew about allegations of election meddling by China and what the government did to fight it. CBC's Kate McKenna reports. In the finale of this chapter of the inquiry, the Prime Minister and three cabinet ministers were pushed on what they knew about foreign meddling and when. I was certainly aware of the various ways um, officials and different countries, particularly through diasporas, uh, can take an interest in Canadian political processes. Minister Karina Gould was the architect of the government's plan to stop foreign interference. She defended it today. Probably in every election that Canada has ever had, there have been attempts at foreign interference, just like in probably every election in a democracy around the world, probably since ancient Greece. The question is whether that interference is successful. 
Gould acknowledges she was told about low-level intelligence of Chinese meddling in the 2019 election, but says an appointed panel was right not to sound the alarm. Intelligence is not evidence. They need to be certain if they're going to suggest something. Uh, because again, the very act of suggesting or making a public declaration will have an impact on the outcome of the election. Minister Bill Blair was briefed about possible Chinese meddling in the 2019 Liberal nomination of Han Dong. He says he pressed Canada's spy agency for more details, but they came back empty-handed. They indicated to me that they did not at that time have um, other corroborating evidence to, to in, in any way to substantiate that. Minister Dominic Leblanc says he was briefed after the 2019 election and was told the system worked. Some of the most senior intelligence and security officials in the country confirmed to me their view uh, that the 2019 election was free and fair and that any attempts at foreign interference would not have uh, affected the outcome of the election, uh, including in specific in individual riding. Later this week, the Commission is set to hear from the head of CSIS for a second time. The Commission is set to file its report in early May. Kate McKenna, CBC News, Ottawa. There are new concerns about the safety of Boeing airliners. A whistleblower claims there are construction flaws in the 777 and 787 passenger jets. It's the latest in a growing list of concerns about Boeing aircraft. And for the second time this year, the head of the company is being called to appear in front of U.S. lawmakers. CBC's Cameron McIntosh has more. They're among the top-selling wide-bodied jets in the world. <laughs> Boeing's 777 and 787 Dreamliner. Manufacturing processes for both now being investigated by the Federal Aviation Administration. I am hopeful that the FAA will not allow this to go unanswered. Boeing engineer Sam Salafor alleging the 777 could have damaged parts. That changes to manufacturing of 787s could leave fuselages with improperly closed gaps. I literally saw people jumping on the pieces of the airplane to get them to align. You certainly don't see that in Boeing's corporate videos. Boeing denies Salifer's allegations, along with allegations from his lawyer. He was threatened with physical violence. He was threatened with termination. Salifer worked in the same South Carolina plant as another whistleblower, John Barnett, who also raised concerns about the 787. He was found dead in his truck in March of an apparent self-inflicted gunshot wound. Boeing, meanwhile, is reeling from recent mid-flight scares. A 737-800 engine cover falling off just this week. A 757-200 suffering wing damage in February. And that 737 MAX 9 losing a door plug in January. The largest aircraft builder in the world, orders were up last month despite its troubles, which have slowed production schedules. And it's probably going to take a long time for them to get out of this because, again, you have to change the culture and they have to go back to a more safety-oriented culture. Boeing's CEO has announced his retirement later this year. Salifer has been invited to testify in Washington next week. I'm doing this not because I want Boeing to fail, but because I want, I want it to succeed and prevent the uh, crashes from happening. Although there is an investigation, neither of the planes have been grounded. Boeing insisting it always works with regulators. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. U.S. President Joe Biden has leveled more criticism at Israel's prime minister. In a television interview, he said Benjamin Netanyahu's approach on Gaza is a mistake. Biden called for an immediate ceasefire and the free flow of aid. Allow for the next six, eight weeks total access to all food and medicine going into the country. I've spoken with everyone from the Saudis to the Jordanians to the Egyptians. They're prepared to move in. They're prepared to move this food in. And I think there's, there, there, there's no excuse to not provide for the medical and the, and, the, and, the, and the food needs of those people. They should be done now. Biden called the deadly airstrike on World Central kitchen aid workers outrageous. He's been an outspoken supporter of Israel's war against Hamas, but in recent weeks, his administration has taken a tougher stance. 
Six former Mississippi law enforcement officers were handed sentences ranging from 15 to 45 years today in state court. They pleaded guilty to the torture and abuse of two black men in January 2023. The lawyer for one of the victims shared his client's victim impact statement. They did some unimaginable things to me and the effects of it will last on my life forever. All six of the former officers pleaded guilty to charges of obstruction of justice and conspiracy to hinder prosecution. The former lawman admitted to breaking into a home without a warrant and torturing Eddie Parker and Michael Jenkins for hours. The attack included beatings, the use of stun guns and assaults with a sex object. One of the victims was shot in the mouth. The ex-officers had already been sentenced to federal prison in March and pleaded guilty to a long list of state and federal charges. Terms ranged from 10 to 40 years. Well, people are flocking to the tulip fields in BC a little earlier than usual this year. Warmer than normal weather has brought early blooms at this year's Abbotsford Tulip Festival. And we'll take you there after the break.
Warmer than normal weather has brought early blossoms in parts of the country. In BC, most flowers are already in full bloom at the Abbotsford Tulip Festival. CBC's Sorab Sandu paid a visit. Red, white, yellow and purple. Rows upon rows of tulips are on display at Lakeland Flowers in Abbotsford. The colors are just incredible. It's just a sea of colors here. The flowers are so nice. For owner Nick Warmerdam, the annual tulip festival is a time to sit back with his best friend Diesel by his side to take in what he calls a labor of love. He's been growing tulips for three decades. This uh, land, uh, because it was reclaimed from a lake, the soil is quite sandy, and that makes it a, a lot easier for us to sift all the bulbs out of the soil uh, during the summer when we have to harvest them. Last year, the festival made a triumphant return after most of Warmer Dam's bulbs were destroyed in the devastating floods of 2021. Warmer Dam says this year the milder winter temperatures saw flowers blooming earlier than usual. Five million tulips to be exact. We had four or five days of weather in the 20 degree, 20, 20, it was around here, it was 23, 25 degrees. And with a tulip bulb, the, uh, they react very quickly to the weather, to temperature. So um, uh, we are ending up with an early start. Visitors can expect to see more than 100 varieties of tulips, 30 of them new this year. Some bulbs brought in all the way from Netherlands. We might switch, uh, get, uh, change some of the varieties for new ones, but I, think, uh, I, I don't think I can manage having more than 100 varieties, or other, otherwise I'm going to get mixed up. Amongst the flowers are scenic photo backdrops, like at this canoe or on these swings. Warmer Dam says last year's festival attracted more than 56,000 people to his farm. We're going to have to see whether we, whether the Mother Nature is going to keep the tulips looking nice all the way till Mother's Day or not. The cooler it is, the longer the flowers stay looking nice in bloom. The festival usually stretches until Mother's Day, but Warmer Dam is concerned with the early start. They may not last as long. Saurabh Sandhu, CBC News, Abbotsford. Well, the flowers might not be up yet here in Manitoba, but it does feel like spring. CBC weather specialist Ethan Williams has the forecast. Thanks, Emily. And, you know, with the rain that we've seen, we, uh, we really do need the rain, of course. But it's always nice when the sun comes back out again. We get this beautiful rainbow that was seen this morning by Eric in Flin Flon. Gorgeous shot. Thank you so much, Eric, uh, for sending that in to us. Uh, overnight tonight, yeah, maybe a few more rainbows tomorrow morning because we will see some showers continuing uh, through much of southern Manitoba, including Winnipeg and the Red River Valley as uh, we head into the overnight hours. Temperatures mainly staying above the freezing mark, though, so this should all be falling as rain. Uh, for the north, bit of a mixed bag here. This is where we're starting to see some mixed precipitation, particularly in the Thompson region, as temperatures are kind of just hovering around freezing for a lot of locations. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, if you're not seeing the rain or the snow, still looking at those uh, likely mainly cloudy conditions. That continuing into tomorrow morning, we're staying pretty much at the freezing mark. And you can see this is when that snow begins to move through Gillam, Shamatawa, down to Island Lake, uh, Norway House. We could be seeing a, a little bit of some flurry as we head into the noon hour tomorrow and that snow continuing into the afternoon. Temperatures staying kind of in the low single digits near the freezing mark. So we're not seeing really much improvement in temperatures as we head through uh, the day tomorrow. For um, Winnipeg and southern Manitoba, we will start the day uh, looking at temperatures uh, in the mid uh, positive single digits tomorrow. Still with a little bit of cloud cover here and there before that begins to clear out as we head into the afternoon. Although we do have that chance of showers, a uh, kind of pop up showers similar to what we saw today that continuing into the afternoon but the southwest seeing some clearing and likely double digit conditions and if you're taking the dog for a walk that means uh, you'll have to look out in Winnipeg tomorrow for some potential showers or maybe you'd like to take your cat out as well Sandman says enough of the dogs I'd like to have the spotlight for a second so thank you so much to Sh uh, Sarah for sending in that shot again talk back at cbc.ca the uh, the best place to send those photos into now a quick look at uh, your a seven day or a, a preview rather of your seven day forecast showing that we'll uh, p potentially be seeing some afternoon showers again tomorrow in the Winnipeg area. Just a chance of those popping up. Winds will be a little bit breezy at times, uh, gusting upwards of 40 kilometers.
temperatures an hour, but the temperature is still quite nice into the teens tomorrow afternoon. We'll drop below freezing overnight, uh, which is actually is still above seasonal for this time of year. Getting into Friday, some clearing conditions, temperatures around 13. I think it'll be a nice uh, Friday for us. And then a little bit of cloud cover as we head into Saturday. Temperature getting close to 20 degrees in some parts of the province and uh, near 17 in Winnipeg with breezy conditions from time to time. I'll have a look at the rest of your seven day forecast, Emily, a little bit later. Thank you, Ethan. The battle with zebra mussels is back. Parks Canada is mulling over a plan to possibly ban all boats from Clear Lake this summer to prevent the spread of the invasive species. That's according to a letter from Parks Canada sent to businesses in Riding Mountain National Park earlier this year. But Premier Wab Canoe is urging the feds not to issue a ban on boats. Scott Higgins is a senior research scientist at the International Institute for Sustainable Development. He spoke this morning on CBC Manitoba's Information Radio. This is stressful. I mean, I was sitting here reporting when zebra mussels did, didn't exist in the province and this whole idea that one can spread so quickly and affect a lake. We've seen it on Lake Winnipeg. Uh, what are your thoughts listening to Premier Canoe, you know, urging Parks Canada not to ban watercraft? Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, that's a good question. So, you know, I've been working on zebra mussels. I did work on it during my graduate degree back, you know, in the in the early 2000s. And it struck me that, you know, these species, the zebra mussel and the, <clears throat> and the quagga mussel, can ins- can spread incredibly quickly. They, they invaded the, the Laurentian Great Lakes in 1986, and they quickly spread into the Mississippi River and all the way to the Gulf of Mexico within about five or six years. So they can spread very, very quickly. And so it's really important to try to contain them. And, you, you know, now that there's this new tool that is potentially uh, available now to, to treat uh, and, re- and eradicate zebra mussels from lakes, I, you know, I really encourage uh, the province and, and, and the federal government to, to really make that attempt and to limit the spread until they, until they make that attempt. I'll ask you, and we'll, we'll elaborate on that tool in a moment, but I'm wondering about <laughs> the banning of watercraft um, itself. Well, I think you can most people can wrap their heads around the desire to keep Clear Lake open to boating, and we all understand the bodies of water being important. But does banning watercraft help prevent the spread of zebra mussels? Well, it absolutely does. So, you know, a minute ago I mentioned how quickly they spread. And, they, and they're spreading not just down rivers, uh, they're spreading between lakes that are not connected. So they are just, zebra mussels are just so effective. They'll latch onto the outside of a boat and you pull that boat out of the water or, or the boat trailer, and that zebra mussel can live for, you know, up to a week at, you know, 25 degrees Celsius. It just closes up its shell and it just holds on until, until that boat's dropped in a new body of water and then it releases or, or it reproduces in that new body of water. And so it's been shown to be incredibly effective in that way. So, yes, limiting boats is really important. And we have stations around Manitoba right now on the water where they check boats, right, before you enter a body of water. We're starting to do that. Yeah, no, that's really important. And that's, you know, one thing, you know, the adult zebra mussels, you can see them and you can see them on the outside of your boats and you can see them on your trailers if you're, if you're careful and you look. But the problem is they also have this uh, microscopic veliger stage that can live in the bilge water of your boat. And that's, you can't see that with the naked eye and it's much harder to, uh, to remove. And so, you know, they're, they're, as we see, you know, even with these strategies in place, Clear Lake still got invaded. Um, in the latest report from Parks Canada, uh, it's looking at using a chemical register for pesticide use in open bodies of water in Canada to help with this. Um, is that what you're referring to in terms of the method? That's correct, yeah. Potash. So what is it? Yeah, so it's potash. It's potassium chloride. Uh, it was uh, registered in, in 2022 by Health Canada. Uh, and really all it is, yeah, it's potassium chloride. And it turns out that... Uh, mussels, including zebra mussels, freshwater mussels as well, are incredibly sensitive to potassium. So they don't like high potassium levels at all, and at levels that are not a risk to almost all other biota. And so it's a, it's a very targeted approach, unlike many other approaches that have been used to to remove unwanted uh, plants or, or invertebrates in lakes. This is a very targeted uh, approach. Do you- Still to come, don't be a tick's next tasty meal. Tick season is here and we've got tips to help keep you tick free. More after the break.
The early start to warm weather this spring also means an early start to tick season. And if the thought of those creepy crawlers makes you squirm, our guest tonight has advice that might put your mind at ease as you head outside. Catherine Rochon is an associate professor of entomology and acting department head at the University of Manitoba. Hi, Catherine. Hello. So anyone who's had a tick latch on under their skin knows how unpleasant that can be. But beyond the discomfort, there are risks associated with tick bites, right? Yes, some ticks can transmit pathogens, and so that can be uh, obviously something you want to avoid. Um, not all ticks are infected with pathogens, and it's not because you get a tick bite that you automatically will be sick. Um, we have uh, two main species in Manitoba that bite people, um, wood ticks and black-legged ticks, and it's the black-legged ticks that can, if they are infected, transmit pathogens like Lyme disease and uh, anaplasmosis and babesiosis here in Manitoba. Mm. And I guess Lyme disease is the concern we hear about the most often. Like, uh, how would you know if maybe you it had been transmitted to you? Right. So the first thing you need to know is um, for a black-legged tick to be able to transmit the pathogen, it needs to be attached and feeding for at least 24 hours. So that gives us a little bit of time. And if you were infected, in about 80% or so of cases, you would get this uh, bullseye rash. So that's a rash that is at least five centimeters across and is expanding in time and isn't so much itchy. And you would get flu-like symptoms, um, you know, the fever and maybe headache and stiff neck and muscle soreness, that kind of stuff, um, up to 30 days after a bite if the tick was infected. Um, so something to be mindful of when you remove a black-legged tick that bit you, immediately just go right on the calendar so that you can remember, oh, was that a month ago? Or, you know, so you have an idea because time is funny sometimes. Mm -hmm. And of course, you'd go seek medical care. So what yes. can people do to prevent the tick bites in the first place? The idea is to keep the ticks away from your skin. So you want to, the easiest thing is to use repellent. Anything that is DEET or keratin based is good to repel ticks. And then you want to um, keep the ticks away from your skin. So tuck your pants into your socks. That way, when the ticks get onto your shoes or your ankles and they start crawling up, they'll be crawling on top of the fabric and not under your pants and directly to your skin and then unseen from your eyes. Uh, same thing, you want to tuck your shirt into your pants. You want to wear light colored clothing, especially your pants, not because it's not attractive, but because it increases contrast and you can see the ticks that are climbing on you. And then when you get home from you know the walk or working in the garden, you want to, um, take your clothes off and check your body thoroughly. Uh, taking a shower helps as well. And so check everything. And if you have a tick, you want to remove it safely. And how do you remove it safely? Aha. Well, <laughs> um, there are some uh, tools that you can buy that are made for that. And those work quite well. I don't have a tool like that. I use fine nose um, tweezers and I just get as close to the skin as possible. And then you grab onto the tick with those tweezers and you just pull straight up steady, steady pressure. And you just pull up and your skin will tent up. Um, uh, eventually it'll come out. I have a video on YouTube. If people want to look at how to remove a tick, they might see my arm there. <laughs> and of course, you know, this is a lot to take in and people might be a little worried before going outside. Is there a way to like calm their fears? Maybe there's a place people can go online to get more information on preventing bites? Yes, definitely. You want to go to etic.ca. There's uh, two things on etic. Etic, you can submit a picture of the tick that you just found so we can tell you if it is a black-legged tick or not, if you're not sure. And then there's a new uh, link at the top uh, on the etic website called Tick Tools. And by clicking there, you get information on how to remove a tick, how to protect yourself, protect your children, and protect your pets. At etic.ca. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Still ahead, Ethan Williams is back with a seven day forecast. You're watching CBC Winnipeg News.
Well, a chance of some afternoon showers tomorrow in Winnipeg before clearing out for Friday. A little bit of cloud cover and some breezy conditions for uh, Saturday and Sunday, but temperature is going to be quite nice near 20 degrees as we head into Monday with a mix of sun and cloud. And then finally, a better chance of some more substantial moisture as we head into Tuesday, Wednesday, likely some rain and snow on the way as temperatures take a little bit of a drop as we head into next week, Emily. Thanks, Ethan. Well, there was a bit of horsing around recently at a train station near Sydney, Australia. Here's your daily lift. A runaway racehorse startled commuters when it turned up at a busy rail station. The animal somehow navigated a set of stairs to get to the platform. The horse was sensible enough to obey the rules and stood behind the yellow safety line as trains approached. The equine had bolted from a nearby stable after an intruder broke in. The horse was eventually captured and returned home safely. And that was our show for this evening. Hope you have a good night.